looks great. Okay, great. Um, thank you, Michelle, so much for having me today. Thank you, everybody, for, for being here. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit today about the Battle of Lake Erie and some of the archaeology uh, that's been attempted uh, around that battle. And then um, just to kind of round it out and talk about a little bit more, we'll talk about some of the other archaeological projects around the War of 1812 that have happened around the Great Lakes. Uh, I'm going to guess if you guys are regular uh, attendees of this um, online uh, lunchtime conference, you kind of have a basic already general understanding of Great Lakes history, but bear with me as we kind of go over a little bit of it again. Um, the Great Lakes as we know them today were first located by European explorers in 1615. And uh, I always find it surprising, but Lake Erie was actually the last lake discovered in 1669. Uh, over the next 150 years, um, the, the Great Lakes really are the primary means of settlement and ex exploration and settlement uh, of the entire area, whether it's on the U.S. side or what's now the Canadian side. And it's definitely important to not to all the land that touches the lakes, um, as well as much of the land way beyond the lakes. We're skipping through some things very fast here. Uh, after the Revolutionary War, the U.S. took control most of most of the territory south of the Great Lakes, while the British kept control of most of the land to the north. Um, obviously, the French are in here too, a little, but further, much further east. Um, over the course of the next few years, tensions are still kind of high with the British, uh, and we finally see an outbreak of war uh, in 1812. Mostly, there's a lot of reasons for the War of 1812, and so I won't get into them. Um, but on the, on, in terms of the Great Lakes, it was just sort of this control of the lakes and this ability to uh, move raw materials and to access and resupply uh, soldiers, sailors, forts, um, et cetera, that are that are stabled there. Um, both sides knew, you know, the Great Lakes was going to be very important within this war. Um, there's plenty of battles north to south, but the Great Lakes are definitely uh, an important front. Uh, a lot of people talk about the War of 1812, and they talk about the impressment of sailors, that the, the English, how the English impressed sailors and that stuff, and it, it, it did happen. Um, but again, I, I, even when I don't talk about War of 1812, I always talk about the Great Lakes as sort of this redheaded stepchild, step cousin that tends to get forgotten. So um, I'm excited to be able to talk about this today. Uh, there's actually quite a bit that goes on uh, throughout the War of 1812 around the Great Lakes. Um, this is a, a very basic map, which I know is not super easy to see what all is going on. Um, there's maneuvers kind of going everywhere. Most of the contention is around Lake Erie and Lake Ontario. I will say Lake Ontario has what's known as the War of the Shipyards. Um, each side builds. So basically the English build a ship in the U.S. looks and they're like, ooh, that ship's really big. I think we need to build a bigger one. And so they start building a slightly bigger ship and the English look over and think, okay, it's time to attack. Oh no, they're building a bigger ship. We need to build a bigger one. And literally this is what happens throughout the uh, three, three and a half years of the War of 1812 is they never actually do any kind of battle in Lake Ontario. They're just constantly building bigger um, and bigger ships. Uh, on, the, on Lake Erie, the, we do have the War of the Shipyards as well. Um, basically until uh, mid-1813 when the British commander, whose name was Robert Barclay, uh, knew that things needed to come to a head. Uh, his most recent ship, the Detroit, had just been launched at Amherstburg, which is now Windsor, right across from Detroit. Uh, but the problem here that Barclay ran into is not that the U.S. was building a bigger ship, but he was getting dangerously low on supplies. Um, his men were very ill. Um, he was really kind of starting to sail without uh, a full complement. And it was either he either needed to engage the U.S. on Lake Erie or he needed to sort of uh, quit, for lack of a better word. And and no, no British commander at that point is going to like throw in the hat and quit. So uh, he knew that this was coming. So during the course of the summer, the um, the British had actually been blockading uh, the, the U.S. fleet, which was commanded by Oliver Hazard Perry uh, in what's now Erie, um, Pennsylvania. And uh, again, it depends on what you see. This might be a little apocryphal, but I always think it's a fun story to tell. They, they quit the blockade. Barkley ends the blockade so that he can go off to a dinner to receive an award. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. But I think it's a, I think it's all of these other problems, this uh, 
you know, his new ship is down at Detroit. They're, they're low on supplies. There's all these other problems. I think they end the blockade to be able to go down to Detroit and get the ship. Once they end the blockade, um, Perry can eventually um, get out of, of Erie and Presque Isle. That's a whole movement in of itself, which I won't get into in terms of their difficulty getting over the sandbar. Um, and so Perry travels uh, west down the lake and stops at what is now Putin Bay um, or um, uh, South Bass Island. Where he, he, you know, the, the fleet kind of holds up and he's basically sitting there waiting. Barkley is up in Detroit. He has gotten his new, his new vessel, the Detroit. He's in, he's in Windsor and he's gotten his new vessel, the Detroit. Um, and again, this time has just sort of come, all right, we're going to have to have this battle. Again, this is something they all just knew was coming. Um, and so on September 10th, a uh, man on watch on South Bass Island, uh, uh, looked out and saw Barkley and his fleet exiting the Detroit River. And uh, like I said, both sides knew what was coming next. Battle was imminent. Uh, Perry leaves uh, Putin Bay and he, what he really wants to do is, and I hope this, he really wants to come up and go around the north side of this, this island here called Rattlesnake Island so that he can come up and be on the north side of the battle line so that he could have what they call the weather gauge, meaning he would have the appropriate the wind that would benefit him the most. Um, because of a number of reasons, he not, he's can't, he kind of beats back and forth and ends up going south of, um, of Rattlesnake Island. And uh, then this is the, the two uh, fleets meet then. So what we're looking at here is the, the British line of battle with their two main ships, their brand new Detroit and their brand new Queen Charlotte. And what we're looking at here is the US line of battle slowly coming in. So they actually kind of come in from an angle um, in a very specific order uh, that creates some problems. Um, they, they have two small vessels, then they have the Perry's uh, uh, flagship, the Lawrence, then they have another small vessel, and then right behind that is Perry's other large vessel, the Niagara. Now, Perry supposedly told everybody that he wanted them to stay in that line. And this small vessel, this number four right here, because it was smaller, sort of lagged behind. And so as soon as the Lawrence came into firing range, which is about a mile away from the, the British fleet, the British fleet immediately starts lobbing um, cannonballs at them. One of the things we should note, the, the mile away, that's about how long a, what's called a long gun um, can shoot. Uh, the British fleet is is has a full complement of long guns. The US fleet actually has uh, many more carronades, which can really only shoot about a half mile. So as soon as Bar as soon as um, Perry starts taking fire at about at a mile away, he knows that he needs to hurry up and close that gap to get in there so that his carronades can have full effect. And again, this is where it comes back to this ship sort of lag number four sort of lags behind. And so the battle really begins with the two main uh, British ships uh, battling against the main U.S. ship, and the Niagara is sort of lagging behind. And because of that, the Lawrence takes the huge brunt of the beginning of that battle, um, and, and the, most of the British cannonballs are being are being fired directly at the Lawrence. And and uh, Oliver Hazard Perry realizes Lawrence isn't actually going to make it very well. In fact, which I, this is interesting, the Lawrence actually strikes her colors at one point, which means, you know, basically I give up. Right as that's happening, Perry realizes that the Niagara really hasn't engaged yet. He gets off the Lawrence and rows over to the Niagara, takes command of the Niagara, brings this new, fresh vessel into, you know, into a battle that's already been raging for an hour, hour and a half, brings the Niagara here right up through the two of the main two vessels who then come sideways and then they, it's a whole thing, but they get all entangled in each other. Um, and once that happens, the battle is, is, is almost over. Um, and, and eventually uh, Perry ends up winning and captures all of the entire British fleet, which is one of the first times that has actually ever happened. It is the first time that's ever happened in British history where they've lost an entire fleet to an enemy without any shipwrecks or anything like that. Um, so later that evening, um, the uh, once Perry has gathered his vessels, 
as well as now his the British fleet that he's captured, they anchor um, and they clean the decks. They bury the sailors and the mariners that have died. They uh, sew them into their hammocks with a cannonball um, in the hammock so that they will sink. And they uh, they put them to rest in Lake Erie. He scrawls probably the most famous note in naval history to General Harrison. We have met the enemy and they are ours. Two ships, two brigs, one schooner, and one sloop. Yours with great respect and esteem, O.H. Perry. The next day, uh, Perry returns to Putin Bay with his fleet and the British fleet, which is now basically part of the U.S. fleet, um, where he uh, then buries the six officers that had died during the battle, three U.S. and three British. He actually treated the British very well. Um, nobody really became a prisoner of war when uh, Commander Barkley resigned you know, the, when he gave up or whatever he you know he relinquishes his sword to them um he actually perry actually gives barkley his sword back and releases him and tells him to go back to canada and to, basically to tell his bosses how badly he got beat uh, anyway with this particular naval battle win the u.s now has complete control over lake erie as well as all of the shipping lanes into lake huron which allows them to resupply um their their forts uh and outposts along the shorelines the so that is great in terms of the great lake side of it but in terms of the greater um aspect it is a huge uh boost to troop morale throughout the country um war of 1812 hadn't necessarily been going well for the u.s and so to hear that uh we had won such a dominant battle uh, up on Lake Erie was really good news to the rest of the troops around the country. Um, and, and it really, uh, I think, sort of turned things around. Uh, now, that being said, um, well, this is a whole nother story. Uh, when you come to the end of the War of 1812 and 1815 and we strike peace, um, I don't know about you guys, I grew up hearing that the US won the war. I recently learned when I went to Canada that they think they won the war. So I guess we can now say the War of 1812 sort of ended in a stalemate. So uh, we'll leave it with that. Um, so that's, that's the very brief history of the Battle of Lake Erie. We're going to move into sort of the archaeological side of it. Um, there's a lot more that happens with this story, uh, including um, how Perry ends up moving over to Niagara and perhaps a, a court-martial against the commander of the, the original commander of the Niagara. And it's, it's like I said, I could go another 20, 30 minutes about that, but we don't need to get into all of that. Um, it, we are well past the bicentennial, but prior to the bicentennial in 2009, um, with, with the bicentennial of the, of the war, but also the Battle of Lake Erie approaching, uh, the Great Lakes Historical Society and National Museum of the Great Lakes, who I work for, um, thought about the fact that, you know, there is a battlefield out here. We all go and, and visit Gettysburg or Vicksburg or other battlefields. Um, naval battlefields are, are a little more difficult, obviously, because they're in the water. Um, that doesn't mean that there shouldn't be remnants of the battle, um, cannonballs, remnants from the ships and decks that have been cleared. Um, the Lawrence, as I mentioned, had almost struck her colors. She, it was written that she had fired every gun until she had no guns left to fire, meaning that her cannons were fully incapacitated. If she was in that bad of shape, they would have thrown those guns overboard to help keep her floating. So there should be guns from the Lawrence out there. Um, as we also mentioned, the, the sailors were all buried at the anchorage uh, where, the, where the decks were clean. So there should be some telltale signs of that. Based on all of this information, we put together um, a, a possibility of where we were pretty sure that the battle took place based on historical things, which you can see here is this yellow box with our, as Indiana Jones says, X never marks the spot, but um, <laughs> X being about where we think the, the anchorage may have been uh, that, that evening. So, uh, we took this, uh, we went and got a, uh, a, a grant for the National Park Service American Battlefield Protection Program to go out and take a look at this to see what we can find. Uh, and I think you notice there, there are no shipwrecks with this battle. So we're really just looking for remnants of the battle itself, no ships themselves. Uh, there are a few things that we were gonna do. We're gonna obviously do some research, do a geophysical survey, 
do analysis of that survey and some GIS um, work, then some target investigation. And then one thing that we were not expecting, but the Park Service asked for us to do was what's called a COCOA analysis. Um, this is something, this is a, a phrase that is used when talking about um, a regular battlefield analysis. Um, and it stands for, uh, I'm gonna say, uh, key terrain, uh, observation and field of fire, cover and concealment, obstacles, and avenues of approach, which on a regular battlefield means, means one thing. So we really had to think about what that meant in terms of a naval battlefield. So bear with me, but I'm gonna kind of talk a little bit about how we redefined some of these terms to mean for a, a naval battlefield. Key terrain on a regular battlefield is gonna be the high ground. It's also gonna be a discussion of the weather. Um, obviously on naval uh, battles, we can always discuss the weather. We did, you know, I did mention early on that uh, Harry tried to get to the good side of the wind, the weather gauge, was unable to. What I didn't mention is somewhere in the middle of the battle, the winds shift. And so Perry, by the end of the battle, actually has the wind in his favor versus having started the battle without the wind in his favor. So that's a piece of the key terrain. Uh, we really can't talk about high ground, low ground, anything like that. This is the, the ocean, but I think we can talk about the ships as key terrain. Um, terrain that you wanna have control over, meaning taking out one or two key ships um, can help you dominate that key terrain. So when Perry's able to bring the Niagara through and straight through the Queen Charlotte and Detroit uh, and get them confused and therefore sort of eliminate that key terrain um, really helps with the outcome of the battle. So that's key terrain. Um, observation and field of fire. Uh, observation for this battle can be discussed in terms of the rigging. However, I will tell you, uh, once the battle starts, there are not men in the rigging. The, um, the observation is kind of a difficult thing to discuss. Field of fire though, um, I think is really interesting. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the British were equipped with uh, a lot of long guns. Um, the Detroit alone carries 16 long guns and the British fleet as a whole carry 34 long guns. Um, the US as a whole, the whole fleet carries 15 long guns. Uh, the US fleet is really meant for a giant broadside. Uh, the Niagara and the Lawrence are carrying uh, 36 of these short, shorter range carronades. So while the British have um, a step up when they're you know, a mile apart, once they get into that half mile and closer, the US really have an advantage. And the best way I can show, talk about this is basically if the entire British um, fleet shot off all of their guns all at once, they would be throwing 494 pounds of iron at us. We would be throwing 912 pounds of iron. So you can see right there, our firepower while it's limited to being close up is actually much, much greater once Perry's and once the US is able to close the gap into that half mile. And I think that's also what helps by having Niagara be open and then all of a sudden come through. Um, she's a, a fresh ship with fresh uh, field, you know, with fresh fields of fire uh, coming into the, the, the battle at that time. <clears throat> uh, cover and concealment. Uh, when we talk about this on a regular battlefield, uh, it, it's usually sort of a natural form, but it can also be a, a built form. Um, ships themselves are built war machines uh, and also provide their own form of cover and concealment. I know this is difficult to see, but if any of you have ever been sailing on the Niagara, um, it's housed in Erie, Pennsylvania, but she travels all over the Great Lakes. It's an interesting sailing vessel because her bulwarks are built so high, you actually don't get to see over and you don't get that nice fresh breeze you would get on a normal sailing vessel. But these high bulwarks are part of that cover and concealment that is needed to um, uh, cover and conceal uh, the gunners and the other people that are on board the ship. That high um, cover is just giving protection to those people. The other thing to sort of discuss, although when you talk about cover and concealment, you're not really talking about individuals. Uh, this image of Perry is actually fairly false. It's pretty well known. He wore a regular sailor's uniform. 
Um, if he had been out there in a commander's uniform, he would have been easily picked off by sharpshooters in, that would have been in the rigging um, early on in the battle. So you would never really, he would not have put himself out there quite like that. It's its own form of concealment, but not really, like I said, we don't talk about that in the, on a personal level. <coughs> obstacles. Um, obstacles tend to be geological. And when we talk about on land, obstacles are, are definitely water, uh, rivers, ponds, lakes, those kinds of things are definitely an obstacle or an obstruction uh, for a land-based battle. Whereas once you're on, in, on a naval battle, the, the obstacles and obstructions are the land themselves. Um, one of the, the key ones I think that we can talk about within that is that Rattlesnake Island that, that Perry couldn't get around early in the morning to get the weather gauge. And I'm sure at the time was very distressful to him, but obviously if he had gotten that weather gauge at the beginning and then the wind shifted, he would have lost it by the afternoon. Um, that also being said, outside of that, there's not a lot here. The, the area out here is shallow, but not that shallow. It's 25, 30 feet, so not shallow enough for these vessels. This uh, battle is taking place out here kind of in the middle um, between, you know, uh, west of these islands, but definitely east of uh, this, which is West Sister out here. So there's really not a lot of obstacles in terms of the main part of the battle. There are obstacles coming into it, but not necessarily in the main part of it. Uh, and the last piece of this Kakoa analysis is this idea of uh, avenues of approach. And then again, this is where we can bring in that that Rattlesnake Island um, idea and Perry unable to come around. Again, this avenue of approach, they're coming in at an angle, uh, which means, again, that these, those first three ships, including the Lawrence, are engaged way before the last four ships of their line are engaged. So there's a whole discussion as to how does that avenue of approach change or affect how the battle goes forward. And again, we've talked about that. That leaves Niagara to be not engaged in the battle and therefore come in as a fresh ship uh, most of the way through the battle to really create problems for the to create um, positives for the U.S. side of it. So this is where we were started taking our cocoa analysis that they asked us to look at. Um, again, I know it's not very exciting, but there was a lot of thought and work put into how we were going to take something that was meant for the for a ground battle and 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 apply it to uh, a naval battle. Um, and so from there, our next steps were actually to go out and start doing our field work. Uh, we worked um, with two different kinds of tools. We used a side scan sonar, um, which is this piece here, and a magnetometer, which is this piece here. They went off the back of the boat. Um, over the course of two years, we covered about seven square miles. Um, the side scan sonar looks at the bottom of the lake whereas the magnetometer looks for changes in the man magnetic fields of the earth. We weren't really expecting a lot with the side scan sonar, but if you have it, you might as well pull it. The magnetometer is where we were really looking to get a lot of data. Hopefully, you know, any t theoretically, basically, if you come over a cannonball, you're gonna see a change um, in the earth's magnetic um, field. Um, we're looking for what we think are very small items. So we keep our, our lane spacing very tight. It's only about a hundred feet, which seven miles and 100 feet in between each one that's a lot of i mean this is i think this, the block is three three and a half long and two feet wide or two miles wide it's it's a lot of area to cover with that um tight of line spacing um let's talk a little bit about the conditions um people say oh nautical archaeology that sounds so cool but when you're out doing a survey like this it's not very exciting. Um, we're sitting there looking at computers all day long. As I say, we're mowing the lawn. We're going less than two knots and I'm sitting on a cooler bent over looking at a computer screen. And on really, really bright days, there's usually a towel over my head and the computer screen so that you can uh, eliminate the glare, which can make it very hot. And then we can talk a little bit about the bugs that are out there as well. So um, yeah, it's, it's not nearly as glamorous <laughs> as it always sounds. So anyway, uh, some of the data that we're getting, let's talk a little bit about the magnetometer data. Cause as I said, with the side scan sonar, we didn't find a whole lot. We honestly didn't expect to. 
Um, we weren't expecting to really find anything sitting on top of the of the lake bottom. We expect anything that we're going to find is going to actually be buried um, quite a ways. So this is one line of magnetometer data. Now we're looking at here is basically over the course of the uh, the two miles. You know, there's a, there's a general change. But what we're really interested in are these peaks, these spikes that we're seeing here where there's a, a short, quick change um, to the magnetic field in, uh, on the Earth. And so um, as we would go through this, if we would see something, we would just basically hit the space bar and it would mark it um, on, on a map. Um, and you can even just see from here, there's, there's quite a, I mean, just over the course of one, there's one, two, three, four, five that stick out right away, but you know, there's also six, seven, eight, maybe this one, nine. Um, so you can see there's, there's quite a few over one um, to the point that by the time we were done, we had over a thousand points that we're possibly interested in. That's a lot. I certainly cannot go out and, and double check a thousand points. I can't put a diver in a thousand times to go look at every one of these. Uh, we just didn't have the money for it. We didn't have the time for it. Um, it just really wasn't possible. Um, so we tried to do some, we tried to make sure that we we, we, we knew we were going to do about 20 or 30 of them. Um, and so we used different, um, different rubrics to choose different places. So we wanted to make sure that we got some down here as well as some down here, as well as obviously a lot here in the middle. Um, so we wanted to make sure we were across the way. We wanted to get big spikes. We wanted to get little spikes um, to to make sure we were covering um, as much as we possibly could. Because as I said, there was no way we were going to get to a thousand of these. Um, so that's where we started with. Um, when I say going back to Truth Tell, we are using uh, finally using you know cool scuba diving gear um, at this point. We would go back and reacquire the magnetic target um, using our GPS coordinates and mark it with a bottle and then send a diver down with a, a handheld metal detector. Um, and once they found something, they would hand fan until they could discover what was there. Uh, we did realize quickly that this area is a very popular fishing spot and has been for quite a while. Um, not terribly unexpected. Uh, some of the other things that were unexpected, um, we actually, freshwater clams, because they are filter feeders, they actually hold metal in their shells and they will give a metallic return on a handheld metal detector if you have a big clump of them together. And that happened to us a couple of different times. Um, so that was really surprising. We found one or two small pieces of chunks of iron, you know, from where or what, I don't know. So, you know, we weren't having great luck. And then the day came, you know, we, you know, the guy, the diver comes up, he's like, oh my gosh, I found this thing, it tapers. It seems to have a, like a, something on the back end of it. And basically this guy is describing a cannon to us, but he can't really see it. I mean, okay, this is the other thing I should mention in Lake Erie, especially out here, you can't see anything. Um, so we're down there and then they're hand fanning and then they're basically feeling whatever is there and then trying to describe it to us on the surface. And so he comes back and, and so we rig it up and we bring it up and it's 155 millimeter howitzer shell, which we were not expecting. Don't worry. It did not stay long on the swim platform. It went away very quickly. Um, we actually, as we continued on, found quite a few of them. And we're going, what does this mean? Well, I don't understand. And we realized, you know, we did good. We did thorough, I mean, I shouldn't say thorough. We did good research around 1812 and around today. What we neglected to do was look at what had happened in that area since. Um, and so we ended up pulling out a lake survey chart from 1946. Uh, and um, there's a, an area over here called Camp Perry that was a, a firing range that was used for um, Army Navy practice and is now still used for National Guard. And that firing range in 1946 went out almost here, right here's the international line, almost to the international line. And the math we were using, it only goes out to about right here in 2000. 
but in 1940s, it came all the way out here, right over where we think the battle happened. Um, it was a, I don't know what to say, except this was a huge disappointment for us. Um, if we had known this before the survey, I'm sure we still would have gone through with it. However, and we would have ended up with the same results. Um, I, that being said, it, it was just, um, I don't know. It was just sort of a surprise. Um, these bombs, these 155 millimeter howitzer shells are much larger and have a much bigger magnetic signature than almost everything we're looking for that came from 1813. They are also sitting you know, 120 years above anything from 1813. So their magnetic signatures are basically blocking out anything, any magnetic signatures we might be getting from 1813. Um, it's quite possible that many or some of our thousand magnetometer hits were from Battle of Lake Erie returns, but there's, with a thousand of them, we can't go there's just not we don't have the ability to go ground truth that many um so in the end this is uh, archaeologically this is a, a really weird project usually when you do archaeology and you don't have a result you can say i at least know it's not there well we can't even still say that um <laughs> you guys all turned tuned in to find out what i found and the answer is a whole lot of nothing uh the technology at the moment isn't really up to snuff to be able to do what we want. Um, there is a, a, a tool called a sub-bottom profiler, which looks, looks at changes in sediment density. So it, it can look through the sediment itself, um, but it's not really uh, good enough at this point to pick up like individual cannonballs or even really cannons. It can look at entire shipwrecks, but it's not gonna be able to tell you the difference or pick up certain smaller pieces. Um, I do think, you know, someday in the future, that kind of technology will improve. Um, and maybe that's when we can go back out to this site and take a little uh, closer look at what's there. Um, I just, I don't foresee what's, I don't foresee that happening anytime uh, in the near future, which again, is a huge disappointment. Um, there are, I don't know, we'll leave it at that. Uh, I didn't want to leave you guys empty handed, though. So uh, there are several other projects that have happened around the Great Lakes around the War of 1812. Um, and the first one I want to talk about is the General Hunter. And he actually this this project actually relates back to the Battle of Lake Erie. Um, this vessel was built in Amherstburg in 1806 as the Hunter um, and was used uh, uh, a couple of different times. And but was a British vessel. It was actually captured by Perry during the Battle of Lake Erie. So it fought for the British in the Battle of Lake Erie, was captured by Perry, um, and was sold uh, after the war, was sold by the US government to a private individual uh, and became a US Army transport ship. In August of 1816, uh, the vessel was returning from Mackinac Island after delivering supplies up there uh, when it hit a gale and grounded off what is now uh, Southampton, Ontario. So somehow it, as opposed to going straight down um, Lake Huron, it ended up in, in the Georgian Bay uh, and grounded uh, just off Southampton. And the entire crew of 10 uh, survived uh, and ended up rowing and walking back to the Detroit area. One of the things they did notice, I mean, when I say this thing grounded, it, it put itself right up on the beach. They, they, the, the survivors were there for a couple of days and, and made note that the vessel was quickly taken over by the sand. Um, and, and so it, after that, it just kind of got left. Um, back in 2001, I'm realizing I'm changing my slide. It's not changing as fast up there. There we go. Back in 2001, these timbers started showing up in the sand there on the beach in Southampton. Um, and they did a, a, a very small little excavation, uh, a one trench uh, and found the signal gun and realized that they were probably looking at the general, um, uh, general hunter. So in 2004, they actually did a full, full scale excavation, uh, found hundreds of artifacts. Uh, they, they really considered uh, preserving the entire shipwreck uh, but realized that the costs were really just too great. Uh, and so they actually um, 
recovered all of the artifacts that were there and then ended up reburying the shipwreck in the sand. If you go up to Southampton, Ontario today and you go out on the beach, there's a little sign there um, basically saying, you know, right below your feet is the general hunter and you can kind of, well, if you're a boat nerd like me, you can pretend to walk the decks of the general hunter on the sand several, several feet above it. Um, it was interesting. So they reburied it and uh, in successive years, the timber sort of kept reappearing again. Um, and so they eventually built a breakwater around the vessel um, so that it so that it can remain buried because it is really safest um, and in terms of long-term preservation um, best there. In terms of what was found, I, the most interesting piece to me that was found um, from this vessel uh, and one of the ways that they were able to really confirm the identification was down in the bilge they found two different buttons, uh, a British and a U.S. Navy button. So to show that this was used uh, by the British Navy and then by the U.S. Navy. So this is a you know one of those sort of confirming pieces. And it was just again I get excited about the small little things, and this is kind of one of those small little things that I just think is kind of cool. They found both of these on on the same shipwreck. Um, moving on, we could talk a little bit about some shipwrecks in Lake Ontario. I know we talked about Lake Ontario being uh, the battle of the shipyards. Um, that doesn't mean that weather didn't cause some problems. Um, there are two vessels uh, that sank out there together, the Hamilton and Scourge. The Hamilton was actually built as the Diana in 1809 as a merchant vessel. Uh, and in October 1812, U.S. Navy bought her and renamed her Hamilton and put her in Sackett's Harbor in Lake Ontario. The Scourge was built as the Lord Nelson in 1811 was a British merchant ship that the U.S. Navy confiscated uh, and renamed the Scourge. Now, that being said, um, when they confiscated that vessel, it, they did not do it legally. And so finally, 95 years later, the owner's descendants of the Scourge, which was at that time the Lord Nelson, were paid restitution by the U.S. government for the illegal siege of the vessel. Um, which I always just kind of found funny. Uh, anyway, so these were kind of troop movers for the US um, uh, and they just were sailing around. And so on August 8th, 1813, so about a month and a day before the Battle of Lake Erie, uh, they were sailing across Lake Ontario at around two o'clock in the morning and hit a giant squall and both vessels sank. Um, 16 men from the two ships survived and over 80 uh, perished that evening. Two vessels were discovered in 1875, um, 1875, sorry, 1975. Uh, and, uh, and then finally in 1982, an archeological expedition went out to uh, take a look what could be seen. Um, this is a side scan sonar issue. So what we're looking at here, this is the boat. This white is the shadow of the um, sailing together. Both end up sinking in the storm and they're only 1500 feet apart, which is kind of crazy when you think about it. Um, but then also to do an assessment of their uh, current stability. One of the big, big, big differences was this uh, invasion of what is now uh, quagga mussels. These are the same two, um, they're not the same, but these are two of the figureheads. This, is, this one is from 1982 and this one is from uh, obviously later and you can start to see the quagga mussels and everything come in. Um, this is an interesting resource down here because both of these vessels are almost intact, complete, their masts are still standing. They are in very deep water um, and the quagga mussels are moving in. Uh, I, I am working with a couple of other different people and getting permission with the Canadian government to start a, a long-term program that would basically go out every five to 10 years to um, basically do an assessment of the 
um, of the ongoing degradation. Um, we're talking about using uh, photogrammetry, where, which is where you use video to create a 3D model. Um, some colleagues that I work with in Wisconsin have developed a really great um, uh, way to do things where basically you could you take your 3D model, you go back five years later, you take another 3D model and they, and for lack of a better word, they subtract them so you can see where the changes are occurring. And maybe if we are able to create those kinds of things um, and we can see where the changes are occurring, we might be able to make better decisions on what and or if we need to do anything with these sites because they really are extraordinary um, and we would hate to see them um, go away or be destroyed in any way, shape or form. Um, also in Lake Ontario, another a project that I worked on in 2009 near uh, Sackett's Harbor uh, was looking for two possible vessels. I don't remember why I have this map up here, but here you go. We'll just go on to the next one. Here's Sackett's Harbor. Um, <laughs> but I will tell you, I was involved with this, so kind of guess what the outcome is. Yay. Uh, no, uh, towards the end of the war, um, the Sackett's Harbor was the main place on Lake Ontario where we were building ships. Um, uh, towards the end of the war, we built uh, 10 of these gunboats. They're very fast. They have literally a single gun here on the bow. But the goal was you can, because they were sailed but also rode they were very maneuverable so you could take them in and you know get off your single shot and get away before you know somebody can can retaliate against you again because they're also they're small they're much lower to the water uh they make a a, a difficult to uh attack them as well well after the war um and, and when i say they built these they built these at the end of i believe like 1814 um, they were taken, the, the, at the end of the war, the U.S. didn't want to get caught as they had prior to the War of 1812, where they had no war vessels, and so they, they commandeered a bunch of, um, of cargo vessels, like with the Hamilton and Scourge and, and a couple of the others, um, and they also had several that they built, like the Niagara and the Lawrence. They didn't, they didn't want to get rid of them, but they couldn't really keep them, so they took a lot of these vessels, because the Great Lakes are cold, fresh water, they actually sank them on purpose to sort of hold them in storage. Uh, um, and so that's what they did. They took these 10 gunboats uh, slightly upriver into what's now called Stores Harbor. And this is a uh, this is from two different uh, maps, but here you can see these gunboats here at Stores Harbor. Um, and then what we find is about 30 years later on another map, uh, a notation that there's a gunboat wreck. So maybe one of these 10 had kind of come loose and floated out and finally wrecked here in, in very shallow water. So we went out looking for it. Um, we actually, uh, <laughs> we used grad students. This is me in the boat paddling, not in the cold water, because you can see we're all kind of cold. Um, and because it is very shallow water, we used uh, graduate students to help push the, uh, the tools through the water um, while we sat on the boat and, and went in the right direction. Uh, the other thing that was interesting within this project is uh, the use of ground penetrating radar, which is something that is very often used on land. Um, but uh, Dr. Ben Ford and his associates at the um, Indiana University of Pennsylvania actually used it over in Lake um, Ontario on the site where um, while, while Lake Ontario was completely iced over. And so we look at this and, and we were really interested with this piece right here. I mean, this is very boat like. Um, and so we figured out where that was and we dug an 11 foot hole and found a bunch of stones. So once again, don't involve me if you're going on a War of 1812 shipwreck thing. Um, but the last port is at Sackett's Harbor. Um, they, they not only built these gunboats, but they also built uh, a bunch of, of larger warships uh, including the of a warship called the Jefferson that was built in 1814. Again, these vessels um, weren't usable as cargo vessels after the war, so they were. You can kind of see them here, just um, sort of tented over, for lack of a better word, uh, and left there. Um, and finally, in 1825, they were all sold off. Some of them were still in really in decent condition. One of them was supposed to have been taken out into the river and sunk. We went looking for that one too, didn't find it. 
Uh, but apparently they also, one was in such bad shape, they just left it there and kind of got forgotten about until the city of Sackets Harbor was building a new marina literally right in this area and realized that there was a War of 1812 vessel sitting right there. Um, they brought in uh, the, now Dr. Kevin Crispin to record it and take a look at it. Uh, and they actually just left it in place. And I, I'm going to show you this picture and just please bear with me. But it is kind of cool that you can walk out to this marina and walk down the docks and look over the edge and see a War of 1812 vessel just sitting underneath today's parked boats. And it's a really cool experience if you're ever in Sackets Harbor to be able to go do and see that. So uh, that is uh, our War of 1812 naval archaeology that um, has happened here. Uh, while I didn't have really good results to share with you, I will leave you with this very beautiful picture. Um, at least you have something happy and shiny to look at here at the end of it. Um, uh, yeah, so uh, Michelle's bringing it back up. I'm more than happy to answer questions um, if anybody has any. Um, if you're ever in the greater Toledo area, I highly recommend coming by to see us at the National Museum of the Great Lakes. Um, we're, we'd be excited and happy to have all of you. We have a really cool exhibit about the General Hunter, the, the one that was on the, the beach in Southampton, where you can um, metal detect around it uh, and be like a nautical archeologist. So covering a little bit of everything up here. Well, thank you very much, Carrie. And uh, I'm, I'm sorry to hear that you're a jinx when it comes to finding naval sites from the War of 1812. Uh, but I am. I, I will say it, it's kind of, I think it's a very good reality check for those of us who know about archeology span from things like Indiana Jones and to <laughs> kind of recognize that there's limits on the technology and it's, it's not like CSI where there's a, a magic tool that'll see a hundred feet into the surface of the, the, right. the bedrock there. Exactly. Um, we'll give everybody a few minutes to enter any questions into the chat that they might have and uh, talk a little bit about our current visitor center statuses in the Detroit district. Uh, the Lake Superior Maritime Visitor Center in Duluth is open uh, Thursday through Sunday, 10 to 4.30. They're doing vessel arrival and departure announcements. There is a cell phone tour available outdoors. You can do yourself. Uh, they have a virtual online tour of the visitor center available and their visitor center um, cooperating association, the Lake Superior Marine Museum Association is operating an outdoor and online gift shop. Uh, here in Sault Ste. Marie at the Sioux Locks Visitor Center, we're open from nine to nine and will be open through October 16th. That's our last day for the 2021 season. The park and observation platform are open from nine to nine daily. Uh, we have our boat schedule hotline up and running. You see the number there. And uh, we have online exhibits and information sheets. I'll post a link to that in the chat uh, where you can go and get access to all of our exhibits that we have and the information sheets we we hand out and i will also take a moment to mention that masks are currently required in our visitor centers regardless of your vaccination status right now uh, st louis county in in minnesota and chippewa county here in michigan are both in the high transmission community rate and our visitor centers are military facilities, and so we are bound by the Department of Defense uh, requirements that everyone wear masks while indoors, and we appreciate your cooperation. Uh, we're all just doing our jobs and trying to keep our visitors and our workforce safe, and we appreciate your compliance with that. And um, I don't see any questions just yet, but if we get some, that's fine. I also wanted to, to kind of uh, echo what, what Carrie said about uh, they teach the War of 1812 very differently in Canada. I have a, a Canadian husband and uh, I very quickly learned that the War of 1812 is not a topic we can discuss. <laughs> it's just, it is, it's just, uh, we're, we're gonna pretend like that little conflict never even happened because we do not have the same viewpoint of that. And, and I will say too, as an American, 
uh, when I visited Toronto and went to Fort York there, that was an eye opener. It was kind of like, where do they get this stuff? <laughs> we attack Canada? <laughs> that was my, fr I was at a conference in Southampton, Ontario. Like I said, I was the little boat nerd out standing on top of the General Hunter, but I did, I'm reading an exhibit going, this is not what I learned in school. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> You know, uh, near here, we have uh, Fort St. Joseph and St. Joseph's Island here in the St. Mary's River, which is where after Mackinac Island was defeated and taken over by the or, um, by the Americans reclaimed Mackinac Island and, and part of the settlement is the British moved to Fort St. Joseph nearby. And that's, you know, I visited it once about 15 years ago, and I've always wanted to go back, but that's not a place on the list for me and my husband to go visit <laughs> and go together. No, that, that would not be good for our marriage and it wouldn't make for a pleasant meal after our, 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 uh, our little excursion. Um, I did have a, a question I wondered about, and this is more of a history than archeology span question, but I was okay. curious um, on these naval vessels, how many people were on board as a crew? Cause I imagine it took a lot of people just to operate the rigging and then a lot of people for gunning and, right. and uh, it, I mean, again, it depends vessel to vessel on the larger vessels like Lawrence and Niagara. I want to say, you know, they had upwards of maybe 85 to 90. Um, I know, you know, the, the vessel today runs good with a crew of about 45 and that's just to sailor. Um, so, you know, once you start adding in gunners and, and other people, you're definitely getting up there and it's, I mean, they're you know they're they're large vessels but let me tell you that many people on that boat is is a lot it's tight quarters um i know i mentioned barkley had sickness but perry also had sickness kind of running through his sailors as well at the time they weren't as bad off as the british ones but you know once something hits a ship there you're definitely you're going to go through the crew very quickly um the other thing is is so the two main vessels our brigs, so they have a, a square sail vessel. They have some square sails on. That takes a lot more um, crew to sail than, say, a schooner with just a couple of lateen vessel, uh, lateen sails. Um, and so your bigger vessels also need more crew, just because the sail type itself dictates more more crew needed. And then my follow-up question is: You know, you mentioned that the Americans seized the entire British fleet. And a lot of people are killed and dead and wounded. And I understand that. But I'm wondering what happens to the crews when they take that vessel? I'm, do those think, crews end up being impressed into the U.S. Navy? Or? I think they let them go and said, go back to Canada and we'll see you later. And then I would, how I mean, did they staff those vessels or did they just seize them and park them somewhere? I Okay, so... I will admit, I don't know 100% know the answer to your question. They may have kept them on to at least get the vessels back to, you know, at least to the, I mean, because he, he brings it back to the um, uh, Putin Bay, which I mentioned. And then from there, they end up going all the way, they, they stop a couple of places along the way to talk to General Harrison, um, and they go back eventually into Erie. I don't know if he kept the British sailors on until they got to Erie and therefore he could reman them himself, you know, with US sailors. He didn't really, again, like I said, they didn't really keep prisoners of war. Um, he, I know he let Barkley go. I'm assuming he let the rest of the crews go. Um, as we were talking, you know, the, these vessels are manned with extra men to run the guns and such. So there are men there. Um, Harrison, there's a whole army just off of Sandusky Bay, and I believe he also gets some men from there for his sail back um, east as well. Um, but I don't know exactly when he let the entire the British um, men go, whether it was you know kind of right there or when it was when they got back to Erie. Okay, and I know that you know crew manifests weren't what they are today. <laughs> yeah. Although there is a list somewhere um, in the U.S. government archives because of this capture, even, I don't want to call it piracy because it's not, but each man on board the vessel was given a payout based on the fact that they captured these six vessels, um, sort of like 
uh, I don't want, not piracy. What's the word I'm looking for? Like a bounty. Yeah, kind of like a bounty, kind of like privateering. Like um, your bonus. Yes. It's a it's bonus. A bonus. <laughs> yes. So all the men in the U.S. on those seven or eight vessels got a bonus. Uh, based on the capture and the value of those six vessels that they captured. And there's a whole list and how much everybody got um, that's still in uh, the in U.S. Navy archives. Well, thank you. Um, I don't see any other questions coming in, but I will. Again, I just want to thank you because the War of 1812 is pretty much the only war, at least international war, that has ever happened in this region other than a little bit of skirmishes in the Civil War, but it's the only one that ever happened here. And unfortunately, it's little more than a footnote in the textbooks that we grow up learning from. I agree. And I, it's one of those, when I moved here and realized all of that was going on in this area, again, redheaded stepchild with the, you know, the, the whatever that nobody ever wants to talk about, but we're actually... Exactly. Yes. It's pretty rich history we're surrounded by that is, is widely ignored. Yep. Um, with that, I will uh, move on and mention again that our next program will be on October 7th, and we're going to be learning about whalebacks, which was a very unique, distinctive Great Lakes ship design. And Ranger Scott is going to look at the, the experiences that uh, McDougall had that influenced that ship design that he came up with and I'm kind of hoping that maybe we'll get to see some of uh, little quirks from that design that have survived into the uh, current design of ships that we we watch going through the ship canal and the zoo locks today. Uh, if you were unable to see the beginning we have recorded this program and we will be posting it um, on our YouTube channel. I will pop the link in to the chat so you can cut and paste it for that. Um, there it is. <laughs> so you can go and, and catch the beginning of this. Uh, we also post all of the virtual visitor center programs there. So we've got a year and a half worth of programs there on a variety of maritime history and uh, current topics that we encourage you to check out. Uh, on that screen, you'll also see all the ways to get a hold of us. And we do have a survey. Um, I want to post a link to that. That survey is a huge help for us as we're planning virtual visitor center programs. And filling it out now in particular will be really helpful because we are evaluating uh, how we want to move forward through the winter uh, with the virtual visitor center um, and uh, what we're going to, to do in the future. So we really would like to hear from you, our audience. And I'd like to thank Carrie again for taking time out of her day to enlighten us on how archaeology is sometimes an exercise in frustration. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for having me. It was, it's been fun. Thank you, everyone.